I'm Daniel Brown. The Machine Stops at the Adam Art Gallery is an exhibition of speculative architectural drawings by 12 of my recent postgraduate thesis students from the Wellington School of Architecture. This exhibition is distinctive in that the architectural drawings are all allegorical in nature, using a wide array of architectural notation devices to tell stories about important environmental, societal, and cultural issues. The drawings in this exhibition address two fundamental questions. How can the history and decayed state of scarred sites be proactively used in their rejuvenation? And how can their tragic stories be remembered as important lessons for future generations? Traditionally in architectural practices, there are two types of drawings, the presentation drawing and the construction drawing. Presentation drawings are used by architects to convey their ideas to clients, while construction drawings are used to convey the architect's ideas to builders, contractors, and suppliers. Both of these two types of architectural representation freeze our perception of the architecture in a similar manner to that of a photograph or a painting. But speculative architectural drawings, on the other hand, use hybrid tools to convey an architect's ideas while they are still formulating. The first thing one notices upon visiting this exhibition of speculative architectural drawings is that none of the drawings appears to represent anything we might normally recognize as a building. This is because these are generative architectural drawings. They are meant to represent a dynamic set of continually evolving conceptual ideas that an architect can draw upon to generate concepts for architectural designs. Speculative architectural drawings provide the architect with a method of generative representation that reveals new creative opportunities by their ability to merge social, contextual, cultural, and even mythological references with personal experiences and intuition. At the same time, these architectural drawings fundamentally and perhaps provocatively seek to blur the boundary between fine art and architecture. And for this reason, they are typically designed explicitly to be exhibited and critically discussed in publications and public gallery settings. Like works of fine art, speculative architectural drawings have both an aesthetic and a conceptual foundation. They are composed from a discipline-specific language of architectural notation devices that can be understood and interpreted by the architect. Some of these notation devices come directly from traditional architectural construction drawings, while other notations are taken from the litany of speculative drawings that have evolved since the 1960s. By understanding the history of these drawings and recognizing how symbols have been used consistently within their ongoing evolution, contemporary speculative architects can embed narrative frameworks into their drawings that other architects will understand. In other words, each of these drawings represents an allegorical story, a tale of mystery, if you like, that an architect can be expected to solve. In this particular exhibition, the speculative architectural drawings tell allegorical tales about important environmental, societal, and cultural issues, tales of scarred landscapes and the devastation that occurs when the built environment attempts to subjugate the natural environmental systems. These stories are readily observed outdoors in our natural landscapes. Cataclysmic events from centuries ago remain visible as permanent scars upon the landscape. Culverted streams remain forever visible as open wounds upon the land. James Joyce once wrote in the margins of his novel Ulysses that places remember events. A tree branch cracking in the wind, fragments of stone tumbling down a hillside, the natural environment calls out in whispers and whimpering groans, its unique form of storytelling audible to us all, if we simply pause and listen. But these seminal tales are never wholly visible in nature. They are conveyed by broken fragments, hidden layers, and torn topographies. For this reason, the speculative architectural drawing also conveys these tales through broken fragments, hidden layers, and torn topographies with a piece of paper representing the site where the story occurred. Telling a story through fragments requires that the speculative architect 
takes on a role similar to a museum curator. In museums, when presented with an array of fragments from a past civilization, for example, a museum curator decides how to sequence and hierarchically arrange the fragments so that a particular story about that civilization will emerge. And depending on how the fragments are arranged, the story can dramatically change. In the same way, the allegorical framework for a speculative drawing composed of fragments is also determined by the curation of those fragments. Symbols, codes, architectural notation devices, texts, numbers, and images can all be strategically arranged and sequenced. They can be transformed through repetitions, erasures, blendings, and blurs. The architectural scale can appear to dynamically change. Locations can appear to shift over time. Orientations can appear to simultaneously represent multiple points of view, and adjacencies can strategically change their hierarchical relationships. Each of these allegorical methods is a way of introducing temporal shifts. In other words, when our understanding of place identity changes over time, a story has been told. And in this way, we can begin to recognize the underlying allegorical message. The speculative architectural drawing captures, curates, and represents architectural and contextual elements in order to generate a narrative representation of architectural ideas situated in a place and time. When I teach these methods to my postgraduate students, I begin by showing them speculative drawings by architects from the past who have mastered the craft, each in their own unique ways. We critically interrogate how previous speculative designers notated their drawings to convey meaning. And in this way, my young architectural students are literally taught how to read a speculative drawing as if it were a literary text. Here are three speculative drawings by well-known speculative architects. You will notice that none of the drawings appears to represent anything we might normally recognize as a building, but they are composed from a discipline-specific language of architectural notation devices that can be understood and interpreted by the architect. Like all speculative architectural drawings, they purposely challenge the boundary between fine art and architecture, and they are designed to be critically discussed in publications and exhibited in public settings. Their primary intention is to actively challenge traditional architectural representations of time, place, scale, and orientation to convey architectural expression as generative rather than static. And in these ways, to contribute to idea building for theorists as well as architects and architectural practices. This drawing by architect Perry Culper is one of a series of drawings he completed for the Central California History Museum competition. According to Culper, the speculative drawings that he created for the competition represent the metaphorical potential of varied mythological accounts that are linked to the cultural roots of museums and to the wine region in California where the competition site is located. This speculative drawing references Dionysus, the god of wine, fertility, and agriculture, Daedalus, the inventor of architecture, sculpture, and the labyrinth, and the rhetorical potential of the nine Greek muses. According to Culper, in their respective ways and at different phases of development of the project, the drawings establish the primary topics and the actionable ideas for the museum and consequently the scope of the project. Culper himself acknowledges that his drawings are often cryptic, but the word cryptic implies that one must look deeply into a drawing to decipher its intentions. It alludes to a type of mystery that an architect can be expected to solve. Architects share a discipline-specific language of notation devices that allows them to decipher ideas through architectural drawing. Culper's drawings are replete with this language. According to Culper, this speculative architectural drawing foregrounds the key aspects or characteristics of the main galleries, a primary archive, and a theater of the Muses for the Museum proposal. Using protoformal spatial elements, language, and representational fragments, it augments the synthetic resolution of perspective construction using key attributes of the architecture in anticipation of the larger whole. Speculative architectural drawings such as this one 
are not meant to lead to a single buildable outcome. They are idea generating rather than form building. In this drawing from the Machine Stops exhibition, Jonathan Morish uses speculative architectural drawings to convey the tragic tale of loss of both cultural and place identity that arose with the colonization of New Zealand. As a way to convey that story, his speculative architectural drawing integrates notational devices from both Maori and Western culture. The most predominant Maori cultural notation device that we see is a rakau whakapapa. A rakau whakapapa is a mnemonic wooden staff held by a Maori elder when reciting the genealogy of his whanau from the present all the way back to the very beginning. In this drawing, Moorish metaphorically presents two rakau whakapapa standing aside one another, one looking to the past and one looking to the future. To Moorish, the Rakao Whakapapa is a symbol for the soul of the people of the land. It is a sentinel chronicling the heritage and the identity of Tanaka Fenua. It observes, it protects, it remembers. Moorish applies this compelling symbol in his graphic search for the soul of architecture. Moorish argues that a building's outer identity, its facade, represents its program or brand identity in relation to the present but a building's inner identity, its soul, emerges when a work of architecture unveils the heritage stories that define its cultural and environmental contexts. As an architectural designer, Morris translates the story of the Raka Whakapapa into the voice of the architect. We now recognize the Raka Whakapapa as a series of rooms. For an architect, these rooms could be interpreted as a vertical section, but also as a horizontal plan. The notation devices to the left of the architectural rock of Akapapa represent our cultural connection to the land and the environmental systems. The notation devices to the right represent the built environment's oppression of the land. The dual rock of Akapapa bears witness to this tragedy. It is represented here as a type of vertical timeline moving upward generation after generation, its upper architectural chambers still waiting to be filled. Also present is a horizontal timeline moving forward generation after generation while inevitably peering into an unknown future. How might an architect use such a drawing in architectural practice? This digital render shows Moorish's design for an apartment building in Wellington that arose from his speculative architectural drawings. The design of this apartment building has clear references formally, conceptually, experientially, and mythologically to his speculative architectural drawing. Metaphorically, its plan situates the inhabitant within a cycle of daily rituals, sleeping, bathing, eating, and communal gathering. Architecturally, the plan wraps around an outdoor courtyard protecting and embracing the heritage of the land below. In these next two drawings from the exhibition, The Machine Stops, Alice Charles uses speculative allegorical architectural drawings to convey the tragic tale of the heritage Kumatoto stream in Wellington. Once it was the source of water, food, and cleansing for the people, but now it lies forever buried in a culvert beneath the city. Charles began by collecting the fragments of the site's stories now concealed beneath the landscape. She uses the metaphor of a bell jar explicitly to represent the museum curator, whose role is to gather and preserve lost artifacts and fragments of time and recontextualize them as a way to bring their underlying story to life and safeguard their tale for the future. The architectural devices of a vertical wall and cantilever beams support the fractured voices, enabling them to grow and be heard over time. The natural environment, imprisoned yet still alive beneath the city, extends its roots along the architectural floor. Its tendrils interweave with the fragmented voices, holding time and place in suspension. Charles situates this drawing against an allegorical text by Italo Calvino. 
And then the shards of the original splendor that had been saved were now preserved under glass bells. And not because they might still be used for anything, but because people wanted to reconstruct through them a city of which no one knew anything now. In the drawing on the right, we see that the pendulum of time has moved and a veil now partially conceals the curated fragments. Their tales of time and place move in and out of the half light beneath the veil. Fragments of place evolve, fragments of time realign. Hidden traces of the environment re-emerge. The veil moves softly, concealing and revealing, connecting and disconnecting. Stories of place appear only to disappear once more. Charles situates this drawing against another allegorical text by Italo Calvino. A woman in black comes along, showing her full age, her eyes restless beneath her veil, her lips trembling. Something runs among them, an exchange of glances like lines that connect one figure with another and draw arrows, stars, triangles, until all combinations are used up in a moment and other characters come on to the scene. In Charles's work, the speculative drawings and the literary text are inseparable, each providing a voice from a different discipline to convey the tale simultaneously from two different points of view. How might an architect use such a drawing in architectural practice? This render of her buildable design still references and represents the generative systems of her speculative drawings, architectural grids, thresholds, and structural systems, interior artifacts at multiple scales, implied timelines and walkways, and the implications of spatial boundaries. The building itself is partially concealed by the natural environment, remaining visible only as a fragment that is revealed in the darkness. All of the drawings in this exhibition, in fact, are generated from literary texts that present analogous tales. The title of the exhibition is taken from Ian Forrester's 1909 short story called The Machine Stops. In Forrester's story, society relies on technology to provide for all its needs. But when the machine breaks down, civilization collapses. This overarching theme is represented in unique ways by each of the 12 speculative architectural designers showcased in this exhibition. William Dutrois' drawing series, also called The Machine Stops, provided the title for the exhibition. Dutrois uses E.M. Forrester's short story to generate an important tale about place identity in New Zealand's rural province of Otago, which was virtually uninhabited until hundreds of stamper batteries now rusting in the wilderness were imported into the region to crush stone during the short-lived 1860 gold rush. Dutrois' series of speculative drawings set out to reawaken and safeguard these tales of environmental devastation so that we may learn from them in the future. As an architectural designer, Dutrois reawakened and preserved this important heritage story by establishing architectural points of pause around a deteriorating stamper battery in the rural wilderness outside Maystown. At these points, visitors can witness this tale from the points of view of seven key artifacts. Three of the artifacts represent the devastated natural landscape, a mine shaft, a redirected stream, and gravel tailings. Three of the artifacts represent the decaying built environment, an elevated trough, a cableway, and traces of an earlier battery swept away in a flood. The seventh artifact, residing at the very center of the tail, is the stamper battery itself. Its tail is the most poignant, for this stamper battery was the cause of both the prosperity and the environmental collapse of the region. This speculative architectural drawing represents the voice of the stamper battery. Its poignant tale is conveyed by overlaying seven drawing layers, each layer representing the unique voice of one of the seven artifacts. In this way, the underlying voices become an essential foundation for the voice above. All voices, in fact, are heard and seen simultaneously. 
In creating this drawing, William began by building a three-dimensional digital model of the rural site and its seven principal artifacts. Upon this site, he digitally designed seven architectural structures that could be inhabited by visitors. In this way, each visitor would be able to witness the site's tale from seven different points of view. In his speculative drawing series, this digital model was used to generate renders of architectural fragments and shadow layers. But in his thesis, the model itself was never revealed. William Dutrois is now joining us. Will, if you were describing to a fellow student how you created this 3.8 meter high speculative allegorical architectural drawing, the Stamper Battery, what do you think a young student would most like to know? Well, the first thing I would have wanted to hear is that it's possible to do this. It's not actually that hard. Let's just have that conversation. You know, yeah. how would you tell someone how you did it? Well, I mean, my, my starting point is always kind of the seven analog drawings that made up it. So it was seven individual kind of explorations that were quite simple, but they were all in plan as well. And there were explorations of kind of spatial arrangements between elements of the site. So this is how it started. So they've been cut up and kind of modified a bit, but you can see the original drawing is in there. And I just simply layered them. And what enabled me to layer them was every drawing had that rectangle in them, or those four points of registration marks that I was able to align. And that gave them this common kind of commonality of this square here. And then they also kind of shared that shared a similar border where squiggles would emerge and kind of it would break into axonometric and 3D and elevation and things like that. So I think that's kind of where that was kind of the starting point for me as well, was realizing that when those environments overlap, something quite interesting happens. You can see in the file, like they're not actually in sequential order of one to seven, they're shuffled. So what I did was I actually layered them up and I didn't like that arrangement. So I spent a, a bit of time as I was working up the drawing, actually reshuffling them and modifying the layers to kind of give me the, the composition that I wanted. This is what we're looking at right now would have made me panic. <laughs> for the, no, but for the very reason, and you and I went through this together, didn't we? I mean, we mm -hmm. thought through this methodology that ultimately it can look so chaotic. You don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to draw identity out of it. So how did you draw identity from out of the chaos? The first thing that I did was of the seven drawings, I would take a shadow layer. So so I, I had the seven drawings layered, and then I would pick one out, the one of the story that I wanted to tell. So in this case, it was the stamper battery of that area of the site. And I took a shadow render, so a clean kind of render of the shadows in that, in that plan because I had a 3D model of it. And so you can see it's this layer here. So you can see how it's just a shadow render of that drawing. And that was really kind of the, the turning point that enabled me to translate that kind of mumbo jumbo into first an architectural plan and then begin to start treating the edges because it was how this render actually interacted with those kind of threshold conditions which were populating the edges. We've got our seven drawings layered, we've got a shadow render and then in the middle, Remember that 3D model that we made and that I never actually used? In plan, I trans I kind of adapted it a bit to suit that drawing of the standard battery that I pulled out and I placed that over the tops. So you can see that that's the plan render of the actual building. And so that's taking the, that what I was trying to do with that is kind of increase the detail with an authentic kind of architecture and, and give it kind of a focal point in the middle that people could read quite comfortably. And then from that, you get these bridges which go out to the edges and that kind of leads your eye out there. And so the way I treated the edges was each, each kind of area of it was a little kind of 
composition by itself. So say for this one here, this, for example, it's a drawing I had in my thesis. That's just combined in two and I use multiply to kind of blend it into the darkness, create that depth in it along that composition line there. This one here is a perspective render. So what I was also trying to do through these kind of individual moments was explore different drawing views because we had the plan view in the middle. And I wanted this drawing to be kind of different perspectives through different periods of time. So we've got perspective here when it's fully decayed, you've got an axonometric. Another perspective there, another axonometric from a different view. That was kind of trying to create, trying to balance the composition as well. So that was where I probably spent most of my time actually was creating first this one and this one, because I knew I wanted those two corresponding of dualities and then balancing it out. And another thing I focused on with this one, because I knew it was going to be on the wall for that exhibition. I mean, it was going to be what 3.8 meters tall. I focused on it having like a sense of gravity. So I wanted it to kind of seem like it, it was dripping down the wall a bit and had a bit of sense of reality to it. So you've got this oil machine kind of grip dripping down there and landing there. That's why those are arrayed in that kind of fashion as well. So building upon that idea of having the drawing have like be affected by the gravity. One of the first ones I put in were these level markers here. So I was using these a lot at work when I was doing this because in Revit you use them and they're quite important to building the model. And they indicate kind of, this is the, the elevation marker of this perspective here, but it also crosses into the axonometric as well and then out to the other side. And then I, I would kind of modify them. So like an, like an empty level marker, which is kind of, they're almost like remnants of that one. Like the drawing has shifted up over time. So I'm using that notation there to kind of show transformation over time. This wire line around this registration mark is used to kind of convey that sense of gravity again. This registration mark is just because I use them throughout my drawing. Like you'll see them here as well. This was kind of a celebration of them because I've pretty much been drawing them for a year straight. Some of the notation marks you chose came from architectural construction drawings. Yes. Other of the notation devices you chose, we have seen over the past years being used by speculative architects. Yeah, and so they become a referential language that has been used over a period of time where mm -hmm. we read them based on knowing how they were meant to be read in the previous drawings. And in that sense, you are building upon Brian Catley, Neil Spiller, Peter Baldwin, Perry Culper, Tom Main, and others. And so it shows your knowledge of them and that it shows these are paying homage to them while also becoming something new. Yeah. So like a really good example of that is this kind of totem pole here. So when I did this, I was looking at Spiller's kind of unique notations that he was doing, especially what he would do around the border. And I was quite fascinated with them for a bit and that was kind of the outcome there. Yeah, Peter Baldwin includes text in his. So that was so these kind of scans from my notebook were inspired by his. I would say the one of the main notations that I adapted though was these squiggles. So I originally actually saw them in, I think it was one of Nick's drawings that he did. Because I and I believe he got it from Spiller. And I did them first by uh, digitally by like kind of manipulating a line like this to kind of convey movement. But then I would start drawing them by hand as well in different directions. And this one's conveying a different thing that was kind of meant to be representing smoke and industry rather than 
whereas this is more of a an illustration of movement, especially with those traces underneath it. The use of the dashed lines, I think, also comes from people like Spiller. Dashed lines showing where movement has occurred. Yep, yep, definitely. What about Perry Culper? Yeah, I think I kind of what I gained from him was because he, when he draws, he draws heavily with construction lines. So that's kind of what I was doing here. Some of his those drawings that he's got on the yellow paper, where he has those Pantone things that we were discussing. There's so many construction lines, and that was kind of what I was doing here, just seeing the relationship to items and what they look at. Um, there's also there's also a lot of theory that you're adding in, and you're taking the piece of paper as a site for a drawing that's also analogous to a, uh, an architectural contextual site. And the piece of paper itself falls into the crack and the layer above becomes the layer below, hmm. which is really interesting. Yeah, and I mean, that was literally what I was doing with this drawing as well. When they were layered, I would cut away pieces of a layer on top to reveal layers below. That was what I was talking about earlier with those, how the layer, these layers are not in order. And when we looked at them, when I had that group, turned off. You can see like some of them have had bits fully kind of cut out of them, squares cut out, you know. Uh, it's really kind of exploring that space in between the layers. You're excavating or cutting through the drawing in order to conceal or reveal mm. the layer above or below. And we see that in Spiller's drawings as well. Yeah. Another notation device, which was quite major from Spiller was, and Cantley actually, was shadows. And that was from Nick Wilkie as well, actually. So it was how a shadow could inform kind of a notion of time and topography underneath as well. So throughout this drawing, the shadows do change and they use as both a composition device and to convey time changing or this model being viewed at over different periods of time. But I also use it here to kind of convey the curving topography underneath. That was quite, quite satisfying to do. It's a little bit of inspiration there from Spiller. I was always looking at his shadows because he's kind of the master of drawings with effective shadows. So Spiller's use of shadows really gives the items like a, a, a and authenticity as well, I guess, especially on the page? Well, what they're doing is threefold. One is we're understanding the identity of the object differently from the shadow it casts than from the view we're able to see. And the mm. two together enable our understanding. Mm. Number two, the shadow enables us to understand proximity to the page and the distance away from the page. But then number three, the dash lines are the, basically it's the choreography notation of where the object has been and where it will go. And so the shadow is dancing along the line as well as the object. Yeah. Definitely. Zoom in on the model at the bottom. This is clearly a render of a three-dimensional digital model that you built. Mm -hmm. What I'd love to hear you talk about is your integration of the analog and the digital into the hybrid drawing. Mm. And it occurs from hand drawings combined with digital drawings that are then digitally integrated. I was always kind of very against just including rendered items in my work because I believe that hand drawing personalizes everything because my hand drawing would be completely different to someone else's and therefore can only be mine. So every time I would put a render in, I would at the minimum trace over a rough kind of projection line base, just to kind of bring it from that kind of stark sterile render into the hand-drawn realm, so to make it sit easier in the drawing, because it would look quite alien if there was nothing kind of touching it. So I think I, yeah, I textured that bridge. 
and just kind of gave it some some human nature, I guess. But then I would populate the space or kind of contrast it with completely hand-drawn models. So these little telephone poles here, well, and they were just doodles in my sketchbook. I think I was, you know, bored one night and just my mind was wandering and I just drew one, you know, thinking about my work. And it kind of evolved into a, like three different typologies and I was able to populate areas of my drawing with them in a similar language to these fins, which I've used throughout my architecture. And I, I feel like they kind of complement those forms in a similar way, but bring a, a more organic, kind of wonky, you know, like Dr. Zeus kind of nature to the drawing by using them and using them in repetition as well as kind of indicators of something that was there, like they were holding up some kind of bridge or piece of architecture. They become quite important. There's also elements like this little tower, just another doodle. And you just populate it with kind of some black shadow to give it that, to make it sit well with the rendered items and suit the environment better. I mean, I think it's important to mention as well that I was, I've been drawing these items all year. So I had them reappearing, not only as little icons within my thesis, but they were actually in all three of the series. So at this point, they were, they were very familiar, well, to me at least anyway. Right, it's that simple drawing here. So you can see the element up the side. So this, this one is the basis or the main character of the drawing that we were looking at previously, the Stamper Battery. And is this mostly analog? This is 100% analog. And can you tell us just how this started, the symbolism of the parallel lines and those sort of things? What's the meaning behind this original base drawing? I began with this one, and this was the rectangle that kind of started everything. So this was a theme throughout all of those. You can see there, the original ones were quite basic. I was literally just drawing squares, but then these items kind of emerged. So these fins, which were holding back the landscape, emerged. It was kind of this fourth one, really, that I really kind of engaged with repetition because it was after our interrogation of that morphosis model, the one where you talked about it primary, secondary, and tertiary repetition that, that Tom Main used. And it was just lifting up the page from the landscape, kind of separating the elements so I could really kind of explore the relationships between them, the spatial relationships between them. It was referential to um, Tom Main, but simultaneously you were looking for uh, vocabulary in the fluid natural organic landscape that could be fundamentally identifiable as the built environment. And so they became, in your drawing, representative of beams, representative of a construction system that, in fact, you then situated beneath the landscape so that there was a merging of built and natural context both being one and the same, mm -hmm. which went to your theme about time and decay and the environmental systems where it was impossible any longer to distinguish the narrative voice of the landscape from the narrative voice of the architecture that had impeded the systems of that landscape. Mm -hmm. You selected a, a reference system of the orthogonal against the fluid yes. to yeah. represent the two systems. And then you began to fluidize the orthogonal and straighten up the fluid so yep. that they began to merge and blend into one another. This is Daniel Brown, and I've been speaking to William Dutois, who has been telling us about how he created his speculative architectural drawing, the Stamper Battery, that was the focal point of the exhibition, The Machine Stops, at the Adam Art Gallery in Wellington.